Hello, everyone. Welcome to the space today. Um, welcome to you. Very warm welcome. Um, and anyone or anything that joins you with us, I hope you all are taking care and are doing well. Um, we are here today for Sparks Knowledge Equity Series Session 2. Um, and today we'll be discussing kind of the ways that uh, research and education systems are rooted in, reinforce, and replicate you know, the histories and sort of the living lingerings of colonialism. Colonialism. We have a lovely set of panelists who I'll introduce in a few minutes, but if you're here for session one, you know my introduction runs a little bit long, um, and I will keep it a little bit more contained today, so you can reference session one's recording if you want a little bit more background into this session and kind of the inspiration for this series. Um, but a welcome back for those of you who did join last week, or not last week, uh, uh, two weeks back. Um, I want to say hello and just introduce myself a little bit. My name is Kanishka. Um, I am a writer and a feminist scholar, and a lot of my work is focused on epistemic violence um, and thinking about the ways that certain lives and lands are assigned the possibility of violence in their lifetimes. Um, I'm joining you today with a black shirt, a long sleeve black shirt. I have this blue mountain painting background that's part of Met's open access collection, and it gives some contrast to my brown face blending into my brown background. And I have big hair and I, I'll just look like a block of black today. Um, but I'm joining you from Toronto today. And I would like to just take a few um, moments to invite you and myself to think about this land that we are on, um, the ways the land is ours and not ours, the desire to own it, to be a part of it, yet the knowledge that it is stolen, that there are these histories and, you know, as we just said, the living lingerings of settler colonialism, the violent theft, the invasion of this land for the many Indigenous peoples who owned and lived with it, and the many Black and Browns people who were violently and forcefully brought to it. The city of Toronto that I am on, um, constructed as all borders are, reminds me of this gesture of acknowledgement. The city has an official land acknowledgement that does not mention the histories of violence that ground the land and its inhabitation, the words of reconciliation, Indigenous resilience, settlers, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. They are all mentioned in the land acknowledgement and they hold their value, yet are robbed of their genealogy and context with the deliberate hesitation that the city has to name the land to name what happened on the land and what continues to take place on it. So we're here today, of course, gathered on specific lands that we are in. Um, and they, there are a few ways I'd like to sort of mark this space before we get into things. Um, we have a live transcript and that along with the Zoom recording will be shared with you afterwards. I just disappeared for a second on my background. Um, we also encourage you to organize study groups. Um, if you remember from a few weeks back, wonderful resources by Sophia Lung were shared with you over email you're encouraged to join um, and collate groups yourselves and in this session today you are especially encouraged to share constructive questions as well as thoughts and feedback and comments that you have for the lovely um, work and thinkings that the panelists here are generating. So there's the Q&A function um, for you to share these thoughts and questions and we will incorporate them as possible into the session itself. So lots lots to think about. Um, let us begin in a little bit. I'd like to do a little short introduction um, and I invite the panelists to kind of situate themselves further in their responses. We're joined here today with Dr. Thomas Boa, whose research interests are in open science and scholarly communication with a strong theoretical focus on decolonial studies, taking African realities as a starting point, he conceptualized the notion of technocoloniality as part of his PhD thesis in 2020. Currently, Thomas is a researcher in residence at the International Center of Expertise in Montreal on Artificial Intelligence. Welcome, Thomas. Dr. Beth Patton, who is an assistant professor at Syracuse University's of Information Studies. Beth's research interests focus on information equity, community resilience, and cultural responsiveness. Her current work focuses on epistemicide, libraries during disasters, and reparative storytelling and the civil rights movement. Welcome, Beth. 
Um, and lastly, we have Nicola Andrews, who works as the Open Education Librarian for the University of San Francisco. They are a member of Nidigati Poa Iwi, and last year published a master's thesis on the impact of historical trauma on Indigenous library workers. Welcome, Nicola. I butchered obviously many pronunciations. And again, I invite you to correct them and to situate yourselves further as this conversation goes on. Um, so a, a little bit of awkwardness and we, we kind of find a question um, that can link, you know, all of your works together. Um, something that I've been thinking a lot about as a researcher, of course, is the way that we do research, the kind of mundane practices of who does research, how we do it, where, when, and so on. And so um, it's very clear as researchers working in some domain of, you know, social science, humanities, equity, um, that research and education systems function through knowledge systems which have been solidified through the ongoing and historical practices of colonialism. And so that means that knowledge can be violent, can be curated violently, and can also permit diverse forms of violation. I'd like to begin with you, Beth and get a bit of a sense on how you're thinking about the violences of colonialism and how they encode research and education today. Um, something that I'm struggling with and I'm sure others here are struggling with is what we really do when the knowledge we need for justice continues to duplicate the very colonial injustices we are trying to transform. Thanks so much for that question. So I, I think for me, I realized this was a struggle as I started fairly early on in my educational experiences that the things that I were was learning in our classes in social studies, in history and civics as I got older really weren't mirroring my experiences or my family's experiences. And I really struggled to find words to talk about these kinds of injustices I was facing in my own epistemological development. And as a librarian, we have deemed ourselves responsible for the task of organizing knowledge and find, making knowledge available. And what that means is we have this, um, we, we have this ability to harm knowledge systems because we decide what to keep. We decide what stays, we decide what gets accessed. And if we do that from a colonial mind frame, which, you know, if you're following policies and procedures, right, we, we are often seeing that embedded in the way we've educated librarians, we then perpetuate those same harms upon our communities that are interacting with our knowledge systems. And so I think for me, um, you know, recognizing that often when I've gone to library catalogs or archives to find information about my own community, it's missing. And so for me, the correction is going back and collecting that information and making other ways of knowing part of this mainstream knowledge construction. And, and you know, that is one of the ways I see it, it, in trying to do this work. Thank you, Beth. I'd like to pass it to Nicola to kind of just orient ourselves kind of in this conversation and that question. Thank you. Um, so I think colonialism has really cemented itself into academia in ways that we we don't really think about all the time. Um, so a couple of examples might be, for example, the 11 million acres of indigenous land um, that funded higher education through the Morrill Act, um, or the history of uh, enslaved or incarcerated peoples who built our universities, our libraries, our centers of learning across the nation. Um, so kind of right from the get-go, we have education being situated as a civilizing force um, a colonizing force. Um, I think today, the ways that I really see colonialism surface directly are through hierarchy and gatekeeping. Um, so definitely hierarchies in terms of what credentials are necessary, what forms of knowledge are considered valid. Um, in academia, 
um, the expectation that students or junior faculty will just really jump through all of these hoops to be part of the academy. Um, so taking on debt to cover tuition or course materials, um, reimbursement culture. So expecting our students and our young faculty to take on or self-fund um, their participation in the academy. Um, and really the expectation that scholars will move anywhere to get a job and just kind of dislocate their community um, again for the job. Um, so I think one of the things we can do when we encounter these hierarchies is to speak up and interrupt them um, to the best of our ability and our privilege affords us. Um, so for example, if you're if you're on a hiring committee, really taking a look at what is being asked for in these academic positions um, and really being discerning about what experiences or skills are actually necessary to do the job uh, versus what makes you feel comfortable um, or like replicates, you know, I've been through this, so everybody else has to as well. Um, yeah, I will, I will leave it there for now. Thank you, Nicola. And I'm going to pass it to Thomas um, to do a little bit more of the situating. Okay, uh, yes, thank you so much uh, uh, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, in fact, colonialism in uh, higher education is something uh, that I'm working on uh, from the perspective of uh, French-speaking African countries. And um, yes, for sure, uh, it's present in terms of uh, or we can uh, identify different uh, layers of uh, coloniality or colonialism in uh, education, uh, in higher education specifically in um, in uh, Africa. First of all, we have uh, this issue of, uh, of language, uh, for example, because we are, our education is done in French or in English or in Spanish, rather than not our first language. This is uh, a reality. And uh, at the second level, we have uh, the, the the issue of the structure of the higher education of the university because uh, we are just replicating uh, the way university in terms of structural organization um, are built from the north to replicate them uh, in africa so it's a kind of uh, isomorphism so because we are replicating them without uh, any kind of without trying to contextualize what is the university and if it fits or it uh, help us to solve our needs as, uh, uh, as we want. And um, uh, the, the, the third level I can mention here is uh, the, this, uh, what Kijano called uh, colonial, coloniality of knowledge. Um, community of knowledge, uh, because uh, at the university, you will see that uh, a lot of uh, knowledge that we are using are coming from the north. It seems like uh, those knowledge are uh, what is uh, the reference, if uh, if you want, and you will see some a lot of lecture or a lot of research coming from Africa will mention resources from the north why they are describing uh, uh, their own context you know so it means that uh, i will prefer to see to see uh, to citate someone from uh, syracuse university for example rather than uh, citate a colleague from cameroon in my work while the research in syracuse university don't really know what is going on in my context and is go uh, we can extend this to the, the 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 to the traditional knowledge uh, the disrespect this the disrespect uh, pupil or researcher um, have with uh, regard to 
traditional knowledge. Uh, so that is uh, uh, what I can say for the I can extend uh, later with uh, other questions, but that is uh, the, the, the three layers I can mention in terms of coloniality or colonialism in higher education. Thank you, Thomas. Definitely, there is a necessity to contextualize. Um, so I want to open it up if anybody has any thoughts in response to what Thomas has said and maybe contextualize um, within your own contest and your own work. This is really going back to one of the points that Nicola made, if I may, but uh, they mentioned gatekeeping. And one of the things that I think about in the perspective of library and information science and higher education is that we do so much of what I call beneficent gatekeeping. And we do this with good intentions, but those good intentions don't mean that we're not harming communities. And I think we often think of gatekeeping as something that somebody else is doing. But for those of us who are teaching classes, who are doing peer review, who are participating in these systems, we ourselves are also these gatekeepers. And even if we're doing that from a perspective of doing good without critical evaluations, we can definitely be causing harm. And I see that connection, you know, kind of in between what all of the points we were all making. Thanks, Beth. I just want to give a second if folks want to add anything there. Yes, the, I, I think uh, contextualization of knowledge also should start uh, uh, by us. I'm, uh, I, from the African perspective, I think one thing we should try to do is to make our research visible so that people across the world can be aware of what we are doing. If we don't do that, uh, people will always uh, 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 share or share our story in our place. So we need to be uh, able and uh, I will say adopt best practice of uh, openness in such a way that you in the North or in uh, Latin America, you can contextualize uh, uh, what I'm saying by reading my uh, my text and so on. Yeah. Yes. Thanks, Thomas. I want to take this into a particular direction because I think this idea of gatekeeping, um, this idea of kind of contextualization, put put us as you know people doing this research, doing this work at the center, and that there are mundane sort of practices around research, how we do it, with who we do it, who we cite, and so on, are these, you know, important, you know, anchors through which colonialism is reinforced and replicated. Um, and Thomas, a lot of your work contextualizes open access as a tool of neocolonialism. I was wondering if you want to talk about that a little bit um, and explain for us how does openness further um, colonialism? Why is openness seen as the goal of our research and education if it is, you know, um, duplicating colonial injustices and colonial practices? Okay, <laughs> that is a huge question, but uh, yes, I, I conceptualized open access a few years ago, and I want to thank uh, Spark and uh, OpenCon, who, which helped me to <laughs> put uh, this work uh, a few years ago on open access as uh, a neocolonial uh, tools. In fact, uh, open access or openness can be both, so they can be uh, what I call a pharmaco. Sometimes it can be used as a drug but sometimes also open access can be used to heal uh, the situation we are facing. The, the, it's just a way to find a, a good balance. Uh, so why uh, openness, uh, open science or open access can be considered as a, a, a neocolonialism tools? Uh, first of all, if you take the ecology of knowledge, on the uh, internet, you will see that a lot of uh, research available 
and um, uh, open access available are coming from the north. It means that we people at the margin, we are overwhelmed by uh, knowledge coming from the center. So knowledge coming from uh, uh, North America, Europe, and so on. At the same time, you people, uh, it's not a dichotomy, sorry, but people in the, uh, in the Western context uh, cannot access to, um, cannot access our knowledge, maybe because they don't want it or, um, or they don't, or they don't have access to it, or because such knowledge doesn't fit with uh, the international standards. It means that uh, why this, this knowledge is published in a native language, why this uh, knowledge is published in French, I cannot read French, or if it's not in English, I will not read it. If uh, if uh, if it is not uh, published in uh, uh, an imperfect journal, I will not read it. So and um, that is the the, the side reality. It's true that open access has uh, an open science. They have a very good practice that can help people to uh, to to support this. But we are still in the stage where people just think that put uh, a PDF. He, on internet is make uh, is to make uh, his work uh, openly available so that is uh, what i can say and in terms of language language will always be present in this uh, replication of colonialism uh, you can stop me if i'm lying but a lot of resources in english uh, are in english so english even in open access english is our lingua franca if uh, if you want in in the research and um, so and colonialism colonialism is not only uh, from one side is also related to the resources you have in your library i can ask you how many or what is the ratio of the resources you have about uh, Global South, for example, coming really from Global South that you have in your library. It means that you can say that you are working for open access, but in your practice um, as a librarian or as a decision maker at the university, you don't encourage the visibility of research really coming from those contexts. And by the way, it's, a, it's another way to replicate colonialism because you, in your university, you encourage it, you, you, you further it, if I can say. So that is, uh, that is uh, what I can say. Yes, thank you. That was put so beautifully, Thomas. It's it's this very tricky and, and fuzzy line because open access and open science is seen as this strategy or tool to not gatekeep knowledge. Yet there are these like textures of gatekeeping that animate, you know, what open access is, you know, language, um, impact factor, X, Y, Z, and so on. And some of the questions we've been getting in the Q&A are getting at this gatekeeping arena because, you know, as, you know, one question has said, um, these systems are hard to disrupt. Um, and so I want to open to all, all of you here and, um, you know, think about, and this is a very huge question, it's a very personal question as well, but what are we doing? What can we do um, to, if not stop, um, work on making our our research and education systems less gatekeepy? Um, you know, does open access play any role in that, in that, um, in that desire to make things less gatekeepy, um, what other strategies and tools are folks here um, taking or imagining and desiring as useful in in, in this work? So, 
I'll, I, I want to answer this question and, and I think I'll foreground it just a bit with a, a, a little bit of a story. So my grandparents were civil rights leaders in Alabama. They sued the Board of Education and they were the first Black people to integrate restaurants and hotels in the state, but they also sued the Board of Education, making my father the first Black person to desegregate schools. Believe it or not, there's hardly anything about my family in the Alabama Department of Archives and Histories, like almost like only one or two photos and it's not related to school desegregation. Well, in 2020, the Alabama Department of Archives and History, I think I'm messing up their name a little bit, um, came out with a recommitment statement saying that for the hundred or so years they've been operating, they privileged the history of Confederate Alabama over those of their black residents. And so we know these mistakes are happening at a, at a national level in the United States where these stories are missing from the Library of Congress. We know these stories are missing from our state libraries and our archives, which should be right. Our historical repository. We should be able to go there and get our state history. But it's also missing from our local collections. As I started to do research about Black libraries here in Huntsville, Alabama, I noticed that in retelling these stories and, and capturing all of the data, the librarians of the time completely did not collect the history of the Black Library. They went as far as to not even name them in the documents when they could name all five families that originally belonged to the first library in like 1818. So knowing that they had this kind of data to have intentionally and violently left off these community members, right? That is the epistemicide, that is the knowledge and justice. And because they were in this privileged place, they got to decide what information we kept. They got to decide what stories are important. So now to answer that question about gatekeeping, what I'm trying to do is go back and get some of those stories that we missed. So my grandparent, my grandmother is still alive. She got pregnant. She got, she got arrested when she was six months pregnant trying to order a cheeseburger. We can still keep that story even though it's missing from our local archives. It's my job to collect that story in a way that is up to some of those standards so that other people can see this as legitimate scholarship. And that's kind of one of those balance lines of I think what Thomas was saying and how do we legitimize our work, how do we make sure it's it's visual and that people can see it, but also that it's done in a way where they can't dismiss it. And I think that that is one of the really hard pieces of doing this work as a scholar. So for me, it's this idea of going back and getting those things that are missing. It's about educating my library students to understand criticality, to understand their own biases so that they can look in their collections and their archives and identify where things are missing, where the gaps are, and then finding the best people to fill those gaps, the people that have intimate relationships with those communities and with those cultures to make sure that we're giving that work justice. And then the second part of that for me is reparative storytelling. How do we talk about this work in a way that lends dignity to and power to the struggles that our community have faced in a way that empowers and builds empathy? And so for me, it's going back and getting those stories and then using those stories to repair what has been broken. That was beautifully said. That was really beautifully said. There's a necessity to kind of flesh this archival absence um, and in that process repair and quilt, you know, stories in you um, and these histories in you that have been purposefully and deliberately um, violenced out of the archive. Um, I want to open it up to others if, if folks want to respond to that, if there are any thoughts and, and take it into directions that you please. Yeah, I think what what's coming up for me is, as an Indigenous person, the experience of going to a knowledge institution like an archive or a museum and being confronted with what that institution has in their collections and how they are described. Um, and I've seen a lot of... Um, 
people recounting like back back home the experience of wanting to go to say an archive and do whakapapa genealogy family research um, on their tupuna on their ancestors and in um, in some Maori culture we don't delineate between say our ancestor and a photo of that ancestor. So we're in a situation where a traditional knowledge worker might say, oh, that's a photo. And we're saying, no, that's that's our ancestor. And that is imbued with um, the mana or the, the spirit of our ancestor. And you want me to sign this form because you, the institution, have copyright of my ancestor. I can only come visit them between three and seven on the third Wednesday with a full moon, you know, all, all of these hoops that we we have to jump through. Um, so that's that's kind of what came to mind for me. Um, the experience of seeing our artworks or our artifacts and often there's much more information on the collector or the donor and not so much on um the indigenous person who made made the tonga um what it was used for things like that i think we're museums are getting a little better about this um i'm really happy that te papa the national museum of new zealand um i believe that they have a director of repatriation um so their whole job is to investigate repatriation of our tupuna um, back to our lands um, and of course when the when that's successful that is all done with ceremony um, and we we get to give our tupuna back to the Fano, the families that they come from thank you nicola i just want to give a second again if there are any thoughts on that any responses Yes, so if I may, uh, yes, I, I think the issue of gatekeeping um, depends of uh, the community we are talking, uh, the, 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 the localization of the community and what we intend for. Uh, Sometimes working on the traditional knowledge, you know, uh, people like from my tribe here in Cameroon will not be <laughs> very happy to share again this traditional knowledge uh, so from them so when they remind the uh, st student uh, knowledge and uh, that they cannot access now or have, that have been remixed and uh, used for uh, capitalistic purpose now so they they will not be happy to to share again uh, they are not really happy to share again uh, their knowledge so sometimes this traditional knowledge also and we should we need to understand uh, this uh, situation. But going back in the academia, uh, uh, the, the, I, would, I would like to point some uh, publisher also. Uh, so sometimes it's uh, inimaginable that um, you research about malaria, for example, in Central Africa. Sometimes research uh, in Central Africa cannot access uh, this uh, kind of paper because uh, they have to pay uh, uh, some they have to pay with their credit card to get access to this uh, uh, research and uh, such aspect of uh, gatekeeping also from the publisher is also uh, is also good to to mention also i can mention the algorithm uh, in terms of research on internet, you know, uh, the research we are doing from Cameroon is not the same resu uh, result I have from Canada or from US. And this is something really bad. Uh, I don't know uh, from this side to who we will uh, reject the fault of gatekeeping or not. And finally, here I, I will say from my African uh, perspective, working at the the time I work at the university in Cameroon, uh, people are, at the university are always happy to get book, 
and to get uh, a new book and uh, so on. And so, but when it comes time to select the book they are supposed to work with, the librarian always are marginalized. They are not part of the selective, uh, the selection committee of, uh, <laughs> so sometimes decision maker from our perspective, from our context, don't take the advice from the librarian to see <laughs> which books is relevant for them or not. And at this time, they are limiting the, their own information for, for their institution uh, because librarians are considered sometimes as slave people. And, uh, yes, that is uh, what I can say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. We've got many questions and I know participants can't see the questions, but um, many of them are, you know, connecting to one another. And I think Beth, a lot of folks have latched on um, to this kind of work of reparation and storytelling and, and working with the archive and populating an archive. Um, and some questions have, you know, also latched onto the violence of the archive um, and what it means to flesh out an archive um, when the only documents you can use to do that fleshing are violent. Um, and so someone has mentioned Sadia Hartman um, and what do we kind of do when certain archives can be filled? Um, what do we do when, there's another question here, um, when we're always replicating coloniality in the archive, um, you know, so Sadia Hartman talks about, you know, fabulation, um, and so writing stories and um, writing histories um, based on some semblance, some fleeting archives that do exist. Um, and I want to pass that to Beth, it's a very, very large question, um, but how do we work on an archive without replicating the violence of the archive, yet still acknowledging that any archive in history has these textures of violence and the, this coloniality, as Thomas was also speaking about, even if it's just it being in the English language, that's a way that the coloniality is transferred and passed on. So large questions, but Beth, I'll pass that to you if any initial thoughts. It, it, it is a large question and I, I don't think that I can solve it, but I think I can answer part of it. Um, some of our history is inherently violent. And I think the idea is not necessarily to have our archives free of violence, but full of truth and, 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 and history, right? Um, and some of that is hard and horrible. Um, you know, I think of, of Tanya Sutherland's work about archival amnesty and what it means to like archive things like lynchings and, and those other kinds of like more horrific moments in our history. And, and to me, you know, there's just no getting around keeping hard stuff. And I, I don't think that that's the goal of what we're trying to do anyways. Our goal is to preserve these ideas so that they're there so that we can understand and learn from those experiences. Um, and I think one of the ways we do that is, is what Nicola was mentioning, and that's through the way we process materials and describe them. I think finding ways to talk about the hard stuff that we encounter in archival collections is really important so that people are consenting to interacting with tough documents. Um, I think at Syracuse, I was looking through an archive and I was reading like, I don't know, love stories from the forties. It was like a magazine about poems, but inevitably, and I should have thought about it, but the advertising was misogynist and racist, right? But there's no, warning of that when I look at the description in the archive, but how easy would it for us to be not to say not to keep that item, um, but to describe like this is also like in addition to love poems, there is terribly racist rhetoric in this book. And so finding ways for us to acknowledge the violence, I think is one part of that. Um, I'm gonna leave the larger questions for how do we make archives not colonial? Cause I, I don't know that that's my job to specifically say, but one of the questions was, what do we do when we can't repair a silence? And so in part of my work about talking about epistemicide is that once this epistemic harm reaches a certain level, we 
can't fix it. If we have destroyed the items, if we have gotten rid of the words, if we have not kept or collected those stories, we, there's nothing we can do. That harm it will continue to grow. And so one of the things I have folks think about is, what does it mean when a scholar comes to an institution and they're pushing the boundaries of what they're talking about and people aren't comfortable? And they say, no, this person is too different than us. Well, all of a sudden that person doesn't get to do their work, but everybody in that community loses on the opportunity to learn from that person and learn from those experiences and have those learnings change them. But also the next generation of scholars also might not to get to see that work, right? And so this harm is generational. And if we don't stop it in the beginning where we can, it will continue to compound and grow. And so, you know, I think that there are times, I, I, the question went away, so I don't see it anymore, but there are times when, yeah, there is knowledge that we have completely eradicated and completely lost. And so I guess for me, rather than dwelling in those things that I can't go back and get, I'm just working on getting as many of the things that are still available and out there. And I'll leave the larger question for my comments, which feels wrong, but I, I don't know how to answer. I don't know how we take the system of education and library science being so embedded in colonial operations and completely making them change. I, I don't have an answer for that. Okay, so uh, thank you, Beth. So, um, in fact, I uh, I just share a link on uh, in the chat about uh, the larger question. And uh, sorry, but I'm always thinking from my perspective from uh, Africa. And what I realize is that uh, so we can achieve this pro uh, uh, threefold strategies. The usual one is political, the political dimension. Uh, the second one is uh, infrastructure. But the third one, which is the most important for me, is uh, capacity building. And uh, talking from my perspective, from uh, Cameroon, I realized that we need to train a new gener generation of librarians with uh, critical uh, tools with, who, who can uh, ask the right question uh, uh, before adopting uh, which infrastructure, so one infrastructure or another, or before they choose the, uh, the document and uh, other resources they are going to work on. So capacity building uh, for me is uh, really, a really, really, it's really important to, to avoid this. And uh, from my context, it, it will take a lot of time. I'm passionate about this, so I'm, I think that it can take, uh, it can be achieved like by five years or, or 10 years, but uh, that is how things are moving uh, because we need to train uh, people with a critical uh, tools in order to solve this problem of uh, coloniality inside archive and library and so on. Yes. Thank you, Thomas. I think we, we're getting some more questions as well that kind of take this into um, a very interesting direction. You know, one of the questions that we've gotten um, are about kind of changing the hierarchical nature of knowledge institutions. And I want to pass this to Nicola, because Nicola, a lot of your work is focused on no more pipelines. Um, and I want to you know, open this up to you to get a sense of, um, you know, how one tries to dislodge this hierarchy of knowledge and knowledge systems? How does one dislodge this pipeline? If we are doing this dislodging, you know, what are we repairing in its place? What is being forged to, um, you know, to make these knowledge systems something that is non-hierarchical? Um, if you have any thoughts on that, large questions indeed, but I know you will have large answers as well. Thank you. At, at least mid mid-sized ounces. I'm halfway through my coffee, so. Uh, <laughs> um, so, the question of pipelines, um, or or rather the 
what we call the diversity pipeline in libraries. Um, so first off, I want to say that seven years ago, April Halfcock published an article called White Librarianship in Blackface, Diversity Initiatives in LIS. Um, and she talks about some of what I think about when um, I think about the diversity pipeline. So for context, um, the American Library Association, ALA, states that its membership and like the general librarian population in the United States is between 80 and 90 percent white and that these percentages do not align with the patron communities um, that librarians serve day to day. Um, so the general idea of the diversity pipeline is that to rectify this, um, institutions like ALA um, target BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, People of Color students and help them through a library credential with the hopes that it really sets them up um, for success. So as a student and when I was in the early phase of my career, I participated in a lot of these programs um, and I benefited from them. They reduced my tuition, I befriended people in my cohorts, and because of them, I participated in a number of internships and conferences that helped me to become a very competitive graduate at the end of my degree. Um, however, uh, in every one of these programs, I also experienced microaggressions or harm. Um, I could see that as a participant, I was expected to do all of the learning and all of the adapting to these situations and to libraries um, and that the institutions behind these programs got to like point to my existence or use my photos as proof that they had solved the problem of diversity. Um, and so reflecting back in some of these programs, I was told what to wear. I was forced to network in a way that was very aggressive. Um, and so in practice, right, these programs do not make libraries equitable places for people of color to work. There's no institute for library deans to learn how not to be racist or misogynist or transphobic. Um, so these programs offer people of color a foot in the door, um, but they don't help with retention. And so in the worst case, if I'm being cynical, um, there's definitely a colonial civilizing element to participation. Um, so at times it felt less like a pipeline and more like a production line where those organizing it really wanted a uniform product at the end. Um, I'm also interested in pipeline as a metaphor because as an indigenous person, when I think pipeline, I think either school to prison pipeline or Dakota Access Pipeline or Coastal Gas Link Pipeline. Um, and it's interesting that they chose this language because a pipeline is inherently extractive. It's inherently colonial. Um, in these instances, a pipeline is created for us without our input. Um, and then we're punished, right, if the pipeline leaks or we, we fail to travel through the pipeline smoothly. Um, to my knowledge, again, I'm not an engineer, but a pipeline is also one directional. So if you don't have the right background or you don't, if you miss some steps, you can't really jump into this environment. And so, and, and once you hit a certain point in your career, it dries up. So again, you've chosen to enter an environment based on institutional and community support. And then the pipeline only takes you so far. Um, so that's kind of part one of, of the question. Um, and I think you asked me about uh, breaking the pipeline or, or replacing the pipeline. Um, so I think, as I've described it, some of our main tools to break the pipeline are refusal and complaint. Um, so something that Sarah Ahmed speaks about uh, in depth very richly. Um, so I see this, this refusal taking place at the end of the pipeline, not, not at the beginning. Um, and I think folks in, in ALA and other organizations 
are very likely looking at their diversity data um, and not seeing the improvement in numbers that they would like to see uh, because they can't retain staff. Um, and I don't mean I don't mean like the great resignation. I just think for the most part, people know their value and they're less willing to accept financial stability to work in a hostile environment, um, particularly in a field like librarianship where the salaries are hardly sterling to begin with. Um, and so I think in, in situations where you cannot leave, um, mechanisms like unions or whisper networks are really important to help reduce harm. Um, and in terms of breaking the pipeline, I'm not sure that it can be done, but I do want higher education to be accessible. I want society to not be racist. I want us all to not replicate systems of, of gatekeeping just because that's what we've encountered before. Um, I just spoke a lot, so I'm going to pause. Such a rich and large answer. Um, or maybe not answer, maybe possibilities. Um, I want to open up to Thomas, Beth, if there are any thoughts on this, any responses you want to do? I I, I do. I think so much of what you just said res resonated with me and my experiences and going through different programs. And, and there is a question that popped up while you were talking, should inclusion efforts anticipate friction and respond? And I, I got my PhD under an initiative to increase diverse professorship in the LIS field. And, you know, they had like diversity training for us. Well, it's, like y'all brought in like four mid-career librarians who have already jumped through all these hoops. We've already learned how to code switch and talk in these communities. We've already learned, you know, the cultural things that you have to learn to actually make it through a pipeline in a academic institution or through a library training program. And I think at the end of that program, my advisor said, you know, now that I think about it, we were the ones that needed training, not y'all. And it was such a beautiful moment of reflection, you know, for her to sit there and say, we thought we needed to help y'all. What we really needed to do is make space within this institution so that we could be changed by you. And that is the learning that has to happen. And I think earlier on, well, I don't know, maybe you said it in the last thing, but one of the things you mentioned, Nicola, was, you know, we get people there, but we don't keep them. And that is why we lose people, right? Because we have put all of this work into how do we get you here? And we are not willing to change our institutions to actually make space for them. And, and that brings me to a question that somebody asked about how do we change this in academia? So for me, you know, none of my family is, is a professor or anything like that. I didn't really know what I was getting into when I came down this path. And I have a lot of questions. There's a lot of things that I don't know and understand. And I wouldn't ask them in my listserv to the other like full professors. And one of the things that we did is we started a research group for junior faculty, for postdocs, for PhD, master students, undergrads, undergrad students, where we really try to like operate in what we call mentoring in the round, where we are all peer mentors of each other. And it is a safe space for us to ask these questions about larger academia, where the answers are often gatekeeped, gatekeeped from you, or that you don't feel confident enough to ask, or you feel like you might be judged for not knowing these answers. Um, and so just creating that space that's like, oh, actually, no, we're going to help each other be productive. This isn't a competition for us. When one of us does well, we all do well. And bringing that mindset into the academy, I, I have found to be super disruptful super impactful and very productive in terms of our work because like I know I have people to go to when things come up and so you know I I think that those are like those other those grassroots way of working that that gets rid of some of that hierarchy and and you know 
hierarchy is there. So I think also acknowledging that it exists and trying to not pretend <laughs> that it's not there doesn't really benefit us. So I think, you know, labeling it for what it is and pointing to it also makes sense within this context. And that is some of the way we can minimize. Thank you, Beth. It's just going in so many directions, so many questions pouring in. Um, I want to just, you know, looking at time, we've got five minutes left. So I want to give um, each of you here the opportunity to, you know, answer any questions that are coming from the chat, if you would like. Um, and while you're doing that, um, what a, a thread that we've that we hope to do through all the sessions is get a sense of the works, the thinkers, the writings, um, the more than writings um, that has shaped your thinking that you think would be helpful for those joining today. So maybe we can start with Thomas. If you want to respond to any of the questions, feel free. Um, and if you want to share some particular early career folk, um, then you can do so as well. No, I, I think uh, related to the time, I will not, uh, I cannot ask uh, any question. I will just pass the, again a link to a book chapter I wrote uh, seen one year ago about epistemic alienation. And uh, yes, and also I'm very, I want to thank Nicola and Beth for sharing their story. It's very uh, relevant for me. I'll pass it to Nicola, if you feel ready to share. Thank you. Yeah, I'm I'm also trying to drop these links in the chat. So what I'm what I'm going to share is um, the document from Te Mana Roranga uh, on principles of Maori data sovereignty, um, which we didn't get to in the session. Um, I really want to share um, Kayla Larson's six R's of indigenous OERs. Um, and then I'm also going to share an article called Calling Forth Our Pasts, Citing Our Futures, and an Envisioning of a Kopapa Māori Citational Practice. Um, so really leveraging Indigenous rights and, and autonomy in this space. Thank you, Nicola. I think this importance of citation is something we, we didn't get a lot of chance to touch on, but I'm glad we're doing some citation work now. Um, I'll end it with you, Beth, if there is anything you'd like to share with folks here. Yeah, I was so happy to hear Sophia Lewing mentioned already, but I definitely want to give a shout out to the book that they edited along with uh, Jorge Lopez McKnight around knowledge justice, which is, you know, one of the first books positioning critical race theory, I think, for our field and all of the folks that went into it working there, um, working on the chapters within that. Uh, Nicola already mentioned April Hathcock and Thomas agreed that is definitely work for all of us to be aware of and check out. And then I also just posted uh, links to some of the work that some of my colleagues are doing. Marissa Duarte, who's looking at indigenous uh, indigeneity at Arizona, I believe, or Arizona State. I might be wrong about the state is correct. I'm not sure of the college, so <laughs> forgive me. Sandy, Sandy Littletree, who is at the University of Washington, and then Dr. Laverne Gray, who's also at Syracuse, who's looking at like white isms within LIS. And so those are those are some of my contemporary, I feel like a really young scholar too. <laughs> so so I, I think that they're my contemporaries. The, those are those are the people whose work I'm looking to um, to support my work as well. Thank you so much, Beth and Nicola and Thomas. We have two minutes left and I want to just, there's a question um, that I really want a response to as well. And it was directed at Beth, but I'd like to maybe open it up for like a 10, 20 second response from everyone. But are there specific methods um, that you folks are using as you're discovering information, as you're looking for research? You know, Thomas mentioned how searches look different based on the geographic location that you're searching from. But if any of you have thoughts, I think the methods is something that we could all use right now. Um, if there's a specific method you like or specific sites, I don't know, that you want to share. For me, it's that capacity building that Thomas talked about earlier, and it's building the relationships.
relationships. I've never been in a community whose stories I were trying to tell where there wasn't some historical culture keeper that like knew the history of the community. And I think figuring out like who those people are within the communities and building relationships with them is one of those ways that you can work to like verify your stories, uh, often when we look at historical records, like if Black people couldn't go to meetings in the 1960s, you're not going to see their work in library protocols or like in the minute meetings. It's not there because they couldn't go to the meeting. So you have to find other ways to gather that information. And so finding those folks who maybe aren't credentialed in the way we would consider professional and LIS or in academia and highlighting the work that they've already done, I think is one of the ways we can do that. Capacity building and relationship building. Thanks, Beth. I think we're right, we're right at the hour. I think that's a great way to end it too. Um, site large, site wide, site beyond what, what academia thinks you should be citing. Um, and thank you, Beth, Nicola, Thomas, for being here today. Thank you to all the attendees. So glad to have you. And we hope to see you at the next session two weeks from now as well. Take care, everyone. Bye.